Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm, and I will be your host. I'm once again joined with my good friend, Phil Weiss. Hey, Phil. Hey, Kirk. How are you today? I'm doing great. Doing great. Can't wait for Father's Day. It's uh, <laughs> my, my, my second day of the year that I can say is mine. So, <laughs> not uniquely mine, like my birthday, but it's, it's mine enough so I can get some happiness out of it. And uh, might do a little fishing with the boys and, uh, you know, basically... My son's like, why don't we get kids day? I'm like every day is kids day. <laughs> like, Absolutely. There's, there is no such thing as every day is kids day, except for Mother's Day and Father's Day. Every day is kids day. <laughs> <laughs> so my son almost had the same birthday as me. So it would have been a little more tricky for him. I wouldn't have even had my own day at that point. But <laughs> uh, the doctors are, it was close enough. The doctor's like, which day do you want? I'm like, give him his own day, please. <laughs> he, he deserves his own day. <laughs> Oh man. So, um, yeah. So, so Phil, let's uh, dive right in. We had a lot of stuff happen this week and, um, a lot happened at the same time, nothing happened. So, so fill us in, like what, what's, uh, what's new this week you want to talk about? Let's start with the Fed raising rates. Uh, I'm not raising rates this week. It's the first time in, I think it's 10 months that they haven't raised rates. They didn't say that they're necessarily done, but they didn't raise this quarter. This gives us a little bit more time for the things that they've done in the past with rates to take a little bit more effect because it's not like they make a change to rates and right away we get an effect in the market. When the Fed announced this, at first the market went down, but then it decided that it liked the news a little bit more than that. They have said that they plan to raise rates a couple more times this year, but we'll see because you just don't know what's going to happen. We can't forecast with any reliability and they don't have the, the Fed doesn't have the best track record either in terms of their ability to forecast. So we'll see where it goes. But right now, at least we have a pause. What do you mean they don't have a good track record, Phil? They have an excellent <laughs> track record of being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah, they're great. Uh, this this uh, this transient inflation, it's just staying transient. That's a long transition that we're seeing here. Maybe what they really meant is this 10 year transient. I don't know. <laughs> we'll Maybe. See. We'll see. Yeah, I know it's interesting because, um, you know, one thing I was thinking about, and, and I try not to read the news too much, actually, almost never, because it's it's completely worthless. Um, and, and most of the news comes out, it's, it's colored by what happened now, right? So it's like you have this recency bias of the markets up. Oh, we're in a new bull market. Like the market's down. Oh, it's going to a bear market. Like, neither one is really useful or helpful. So one of the reasons that um, on this show, we spend a lot of time talking about mindset is because of this, this recency bias, or we call being triggered, right? Being triggered is like saying, um, somebody saying, oh, well, uh, uh, here's, here's the way things happen. Well, did they happen that way? Well, maybe I should think about this. Well, the market's going down. Maybe I should jump out my window. Like maybe I should go all the cash. Maybe I should sell everything. Market's going up. Well, let me put it all in the market. Like there's no context to any of it, but people get triggered by the news and they think, oh, I'm in the wrong place. And it depends on your context. Are you in the wrong place? Well, I guess it depends on what you're doing, right? If the market's going up and you're shorting the market, okay, you're in the wrong place. If the market's going up and you're in bonds, well, it doesn't mean you're necessarily in the wrong place. It depends what you're trying to accomplish. And so I think the the news does everybody a huge disservice, which is why I don't look at it. Even the financial news, I don't, I don't look at it. I have my source of information just like Phil does. And so it's not like I don't know what's going on, but I'm not reading the news and opinion pieces, which is basically what the news is nowadays. So, you know, I look at the Fed and I want to hear more from you, uh, Phil, about the Fed. But um, I was thinking about it uh, this morning about the Fed meeting and kind of what happened, what they said. And there were a few things that I found interesting. Now, one of the things I found interesting was some of the things that Powell said. And one of the things he said was, um, you know, it'll be appropriate to cut rates at a time where inflation's coming down really significantly. And again, we're talking a couple of years out. Now, just because he said that, it doesn't mean it's a couple of years out, right? Just like transient doesn't mean it's going to be transient. However, this is how he's thinking. And this is what he wants the market to think. So, you know, part of the reason that investing is so challenging is because 
people take data and they, uh, I forget who said this, it was Howard Marks or someone else who called it level one thinking. You look at data and you assume the data is accurate. Okay, this is the data, we're gonna react to the data. The problem is the market doesn't react to the data. The market is level two thinking, which is, all right, there's the data. And then level two thinking is, how's the market gonna react to the data? And then how should we be thinking about it in reaction to that reaction, right? So you're, you're taking a step removed. Or like we talk about in the show, which is, hey, some news came out. Where's the market gonna go? Well, technically the market is already six months ahead of wherever you're thinking. And the market is, is basically discounting six months from now. So if the market's going up, it's because they think rates are gonna go down, gonna to continue to go down for six months from now. If they think rates are gonna go up, the market's probably gonna go down, right? It just assuming that, co that correlation is the same. But most of us live in the present, right? In order to live in the future, it's really challenging. And it's really hard for even experts to do this because you have to constantly be thinking ahead and like, all right, what's gonna happen to cause this? So in some of his statements that we're talking a couple of years out, He's saying that because he wants to tell the market that they should be thinking a few years out. Now, the market, fortunately, is already thinking of this because the bond yields for a few years, like two years out, are still 5%. If you look three months ago, they weren't 5%. They were really, they were much lower because the market was expecting by the end, by, by June, and, and you can look back in this history, and I wish I kept all of these, these, these snapshots. If you look back in February, they thought May to June the market's going to start easing rates. And then you get to April. Well, it's going to be July and September. And then it keeps moving forward, moving forward. And till the point where we get to a point, it's like, well, all right, now it's September of 2021 and the market's assuming it's going to be 5% for the next five years, right? So it takes a while for the market to adapt. So the Federal Reserve, what they're doing is their talk of a few years out means that they're trying to... Uh, condition the market to think a few years out. Now, if the market decides to roll over and go into recession later in this year, which I don't think anybody's predicting at this point, um, but if that happens later this year, then that's gonna change the six month picture, right? And maybe the Fed has to lower rates. I don't think they're gonna lower rates even if we do hit a speed bump. I think that they're gonna, and I've been claiming this in the show and I keep claiming this until facts change, the Federal Reserve is going to keep rates higher longer than most people predict. Started saying this last year, and it's still true. We're going to find out. In 2008, 2009, I said the same thing. Rates are going to stay lower than most people think, and that's what happened. Same thing here. Rates are going to stay higher longer than most people think, which means it's going to take the market a while to adapt to higher rates, which means that eventually you're going to see 10 years at 5% and other things, assuming we don't hit a recession. But the fact that we have a five to five and a quarter percent Fed funds rate and we don't have a recession means that we don't need to lower rates. The rates are supportable by the economy. Now, we could argue whether they are or not. But the fact is, the stock market's holding up. The economy's holding up. Unemployment is low. Why lower rates? There's no reason to lower rates, which means that five percent is a reasonable rate at this point. Now, whether they need to keep raising it, I, I can't. I can't tell because the rates haven't gone up enough to see if they'll support it. But at this point, it looks to me as if the market and the economy can support a 5% Fed funds rate, which basically means eventually other rates are going to catch up and they're going to flatten out right around 5% or maybe more. But at the moment, it looks like it's supportable. Now, the question is, and this is where it gets into mental mind games, right? So at the moment, there's no reason to, there's no reason to lower rates. Okay, what would be a reason? Well, inflation is dropping. Now it's 4.1%, right? And the CPI is 4.1%. Now the, the CPE, uh, the PCE is, is, is still high. So you could argue the Fed, the Fed likes uh, that, um, th they like that measure. But what if the CPI goes to 2% or my, my tongue in cheek prediction earlier, 0%. I said it tongue in cheek, but I wasn't entirely, you know, provocative. Like there's some truth to why that could happen. And I did say that, and I was 100% honest when I said that this very well could happen. I don't truly think there's a high probability, but it's possible. And so if you look at that and say, well, what if that happens? What's the Fed going to do? Are they going to keep it at 5%? What if the economy's fine? Are you going to lower the rates? Like, that's a that's a predicament, right? Like, Phil, what would you do if you were the Fed? And, and, and the economy's fine at 5% and inflation's like, you know, 1% or 2%. What would you do? 
I don't think I'd lower rates in, in that situation because if I do, I get worried that the economy is going to overheat because I make money cheaper. Because that's really what rates do is right? they make money cheaper and the more money that and more available. And that's usually done to spur the economy. But if the economy is moving along at the right pace, there's no need to raise rates. But I mean, then what happens? Because then you hit deflation. <laughs> right yeah. so this is the balance right this is right. the tricky part so what happens if rates go negative and the fed keeps them they're going to keep going negative and then we become japan which has always been kind of like a prediction i've had in the back of my pocket which is not a high probability play but that's the fed's biggest fear is we become japan and then we can't get out of it so right. which one's worse deflation or continued high inflation or hyperinflation <laughs> I mean, if I look at Japan, I'd say that would be worse, right? Because that economy and that country has not grown for years. I mean, that market peaked back in the 80s when real estate prices went out of control and it's never been back. I mean, I always use that when I'm talking about an example and we talk about how I expect things are going to go up over time because that's normally what markets do. I usually qualify that, say, unless for Japan, because Japan, that's not what happened. They hit a peak that they've never returned to and it's been... 30 40 years since they hit that level yeah it's it's a it's a challenge and, and i think you know japan was always so there's there's two there's two basic big fears the fed has that you have japan on one hand and you have hyperinflation like zimbabwe on the other hand right those are the two extremes and you could argue which one's better i would argue deflation's much better than hyperinflation um but basically what happened to Japan, and we should probably have a whole episode on this because I, I wrote a, a blog post on this a while ago. Basically what happened in Japan is 1990, the market peaked and it had uh, deflation for the next 30, well, I guess you could argue whether they are now, but the market has not hit the peak and it's been 33 years. So you had deflation for a long period of time and I'll have to pull up how long, but it was over 20 years. You had, I think it was like 22 years, the market went down. Imagine having a stock market going down for 22 years. How's your, how's your, how's your retirement going, Phil? If you're, <laughs> if you're pouring good money after bad for 22 years, oh, it'll come back. Yeah, that's not a good situation for retirement in any way, shape or form, because that's not what we're expecting. Right, right. You're investing because you expect future dollars to be worth more when you're investing because the company is going to grow. But what if it doesn't? And I think we all make these assumptions with investing. We're making an assumption like real estate always goes up. That's an assumption. And when it didn't hold true, the whole system melted down. What, what about um, you know, U.S. Treasuries being the risk-free rate? It's the risk-free rate. But what if it isn't? The whole system will melt down because everyone's baking in an assumption that this is going to hold true. If we have hyperinflation, if we have deflation, I don't know what's going to happen. We talked about uh was it the the tens mostly in the tens we were talking about negative interest rates we had negative interest rates up until whatever it was a few years ago i mean most european countries japan and a few others had negative interest rates that basically means you're giving the, the country money and they're going to give you less back i mean that's ridiculous why would i give the u.s government money and they're going to give them a thousand dollars they're going to give me back 950 dollars I'll just stick it under my mattress and be better off. That's but, just what I was going to say. I never, I never understood that, that I would give a bank a thousand dollars and expect to get back to pick a number 950. Like you said, just stick that money under the mattress because I'm better off. Right. So here's the argument. And, and I, I actually put a lot of thought into this because to me it was puzzling. And there was a time in 2012, I read an article and, and I think it was Europe, uh, I forget, it was one of the Scandinavian countries, I think, um, where there was a business that was, um, let's say a, they did some unmentionables, um, but they borrowed money from the bank at a negative rate. So the bank paid them to borrow money. Think about the, 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 um, the mental gymnastics you have to go through to figure out, I'm bar. You know, I mean, think about it. If I could borrow money from the bank at, at you know, a million dollars at 0%, how much would I take out? Well, as much as they give me. Right. What if I was borrowing at a negative rate? So they're paying me to take money. I'd take, I'd, take, I'd take all my friends and go to the bank and take as much as they'd give us. I mean, that is ridiculous. There's no reason to not borrow as much as possible at negative rates. So 
that's one side of the equation, right? Is that you have you basically have incentivization, you have in incentives to borrow more money at lower rates, which is why we have this real estate bubble, because if you're borrowing at two and a half percent, why wouldn't you borrow money? Just borrow as much as you can, right? Right. Over 30 years. Now, here's the problem. If you're Europe and you have negative interest rates, you have a few problems. So first of all, you don't put your money in the bank, because why would you? Because you're just gonna lose money, right? Put your money on the mattress. But what if I'm, a hundred million dollar institution. I, I don't have a mattress big enough to put all my cash under there. So I have to use the banks, right? Well, there comes a point where you have to use the banks and, but then you also have the currency problem, right? How is your currency doing to other currencies, right? So it could be that putting money in and losing half a percent a year in your money is a much better scenario than putting it in other currencies or other assets. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't make sense on a level one thinking, but if you look at level two, level th three thinking, it actually, it does make sense. Um, but it makes sense in a, in, a, in a weird sort of way. And so much so that there was actually, I forget who this was, it was one of the, um, it might've been one of the larger uh, insurance institutions, but there was a big insurance institution in Germany, I believe, where they bought uh, an old mine that, that they turned into like a vault and like this was like a, a thing a while back where you you know these old mines they would actually go in and they would developers would come in and they'd support it all and they'd build up infrastructure and it was cool so you could store stuff down there safely um and so what they did is they created vaults in these places and so that what this insurance company did is they said well, we have a hundred million dollars in cash what are we gonna do with it took half the money and put it in cash and the other half they put in gold in one of these vaults because if you have deflation, gold should still retain its, its purchasing power, right? right? You can argue whether it's up or down, but purchasing power should be retained. Just like when you have inflation, gold should still retain its purchasing power. So that's what they did. So there are a lot of creative ways people tried to solve the problem. As an individual, you can just put money under a mattress. If, you have, if you're an institution, you can't do that. So the deflation problem is huge because it unwinds the financial system and quite frankly, our economy because our economy is based on debt and positive inflation. Here's the big problem. Let's, let's, so Phil, you, you buy a house, right? You, you buy a house for a million dollars. You're, you're, you, you have a nice house, buy a million dollar house. And let's say for the sake of argument, cause I don't want to do the math. You, you buy a hundred percent mortgage, right? So you don't put any cash down. It's a million dollar mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. So this house is worth a million dollars. You have payments on a million dollar mortgage. Now, if you have inflation, then that house price over time might go to a million and a half. Your mortgage is still a million dollars, which you're paying down, but let's say you're not. You're, you're still a million dollars. You just made a half million dollars, right? right? That's great, right? That's how our system is built, right? Is people making money off of inflation, expected inflation. What, if, what happens if you have deflation? What happens if your house, your million dollar house price goes down 20%? I'm in trouble because I got a million dollars of debt and I can't even sell my house to satisfy the mortgage. That's not a good situation to be in at all. And it's just like, if you bought before we had the housing crisis, like I have people in my neighborhood, they bought at the wrong time. It took until COVID when housing prices really started to go up that they got back above the price that they paid for their house. Now, if you had too much borrowed, you sell, you're underwater and that's just not a good outcome. Yeah. So think about it this way. This is what happened in Japan. If you look at, and, and I'll, I'll try to pull this blog post because I had a lot of good charts on Japan from a while back. If you look at Japanese real estate, real estate declined, I forget it was like 2% a year or something like that, but it was declining 2% a year. And over time, you know, this is the same problem that Phil just talked about. You know, if you, if your real estate goes down 20% or let's say, well, if you have deflation, let's say over, you have 2% deflation over 10 years. I, I'm, the math doesn't work out. Let's say you have 2% deflation over 10 years, it's, it goes down 20%. Um, then you effectively have real estate that tends to mark inflation. So it'll go up or down based on inflation and deflation. So you have 20% deflation, which means your real estate's really worth 800,000. But your mortgage does not depreciate. It is still worth a uh, million dollars. So debt is worth more in a deflationary time. 
right? If you if you you know if, if you're lending money, it's worth more because your your dollars are worth the same amount, but the person spending it has fewer dollars to pay it. So it's more expensive for the debtor, it's uh, or the borrower, it's uh, more it's less expensive for the um, uh, for the lender. So you want to be a lender in that time, even though you know you want cash, you want debt in deflationary times. In inflationary times, your debt is devalued uh, through inflation. So real estate's great through inflationary times, but if you have deflation, real estate is a disaster. Mm -hmm. The more leverage you have in the system, the more of a disaster it becomes because as Phil said, you can't sell your house. If you did, you'd owe $200,000 to sell your house. You could say, well, I'll just file for bankruptcy. Yeah, if you don't wanna buy another house for seven years, you could do that. Um, but but the problem is is in deflation you want to have uh, ideally you don't want to borrow money right you you want to have it paid off if you're going to lose value in your home that's fine you lose value um, as long as you can sustain it the problem is if you're rent you say I'm going to rent my house deflation affects everything so let's say you're renting it Phil and you have deflation well you're whatever it is two thousand bucks a month whatever it is you're renting it for. 2000 bucks a month, we'll say it's a thousand because I don't like round numbers. So, so a thousand bucks a month, that's going to decline 20% too. So now you can't rent it for a thousand. You can only rent it for 800. So this negative spiral of deflation is what the Fed is worried about. You can't easily get out of that, which is why Japan has been in deflationary times for like 30 years is because they couldn't get out of it. Now, at some point, the whole system resets with that deflation, the whole system resets People go ba bankrupt, go bankrupt, all that stuff, all that, all that, you know, the, the excess in the system gets filtered out and then we can start anew, right? That's the whole point of bankruptcy. That's why we have bankruptcy laws, because if people go bankrupt, they clear the slate and they start afresh, right? We made a mistake. Let's start again. You know, some countries, you go to jail if you file for bankruptcy until you pay the debt back. That's not an entrepreneurial environment. Why would I start a business? If I fail, I go to jail, right? That's not incentive. <laughs> This country has great incentives around bankruptcy laws. So if you think about the deflation, that is also a big problem that the Fed is worried about. So I bring this up because this is such a complex problem that the Fed is trying to navigate. And there are no easy outcomes for this. They want a soft landing. I very much hope they find one. Because if they don't, we're going to have a very volatile ride or potentially a very bad situation. Um, you know, personally, I've, I've said this on the show a lot. We, start, we sold our condo last year and we've been renting. And we'll probably continue to rent until this gets sorted out because I, I, without knowing the future, I'm not willing to take a big loss uh, or I'm not willing to overpay for, for something that is going to come down later. And renting is okay. And maybe my rent will go down because we have deflation. I have no idea. But the point is you need to start thinking outside the box and, and assessing the assumptions you're making with your portfolios, with your life, anything that affects you financially, because the impact will be significant if the trends, if the Fed doesn't have a soft landing. I think that's fair. And the other point and side of that is if you think back when the Fed started to raise rates because we had inflation, earlier in my career, I did international tax work and the companies that I worked for had subsidiaries that were based in countries like Brazil where they had hyperinflation. And so then you have the exact opposite impact. When there's hyperinflation, I never want to put money in the bank. As soon as you pay me, I basically want to spend it because if I hold it for a day, it's worth less because inflation is so high. So that's why they had to start to do, you can argue whether or not they waited too long. That's a different question or a different conversation, but they had to start to do something because they don't want inflation to get out of control because then you end up with the exact opposite of what you described, where now your money is worth less. So you want to have those assets instead of holding on to cash, you can't hold it because the cash just devalues every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a real, it's a real problem. And, and this is, this is why we, we talk about it on the show is um, one of the challenges that happened in the seventies was mass confusion it was people not knowing uh, what was going on, why it was happening. These stagflation, the term was coined in the seventies. It never, I don't want to say it never happened before, but it wasn't, understood prior to that. And then once it did be like, oh, the, you know, economists are great coming in after the fact and say, oh, this is why this happened. Like, why didn't you predict it before? Well, we'd never seen it before and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, on the one hand this way and the other hand this way, economists are, I mean, 
I have a background in economics, so I could say this, but economic, economics is a stupid profession. Um, it's a bunch of people coming after the fact and explain what happened, why, why they didn't understand yesterday what happened, wh why they didn't understand the future what happened yesterday. Like they're just, it, it's just it's comical. There was a great um, meme on this. Uh, I'll, I'll share it on the show someday. Um, but, but basically economics is, it's just people trying to explain things that happen when quite frankly, sometimes you just can't. So the, the stagflation um, uh, concept happened when we had high unemployment, economic stagnation, high inflation. And, you know, if you have high enough inflation, it's going to be a problem for everybody because they can't afford what they're doing. Now, we had Oliver Roos on the show. Um, uh, actually, I don't think it's gone live yet, but he'll, he'll come out live soon uh, from Trueflation. I was on his show a few days ago and um, he has different inflation metrics, which I kind of like. And his show inflation is much lower. Now, the Fed came out with their talk. And one of the things they said was, let's see if I can pull it up here. One of the things they said is, you know, we're going to get inflation down to 2% over time um, and do that with a minimum damage to the economy. Of course, right? <laughs> of course they will. Of course, of course they will. Minimum damage. Um, you know, but the problem is, is, you know, based on the trend line that we're seeing with the CPI projection, we're going to be, if I look at this, we're going to be at 2% probably by September at this rate, right? In June, probably 3.2. So you're looking maybe August, it'll be 2%. I mean, it's, de it's decelerating fast. And so we could hit 2% soon. And then what's the Fed going to do? Now, by Oliver's uh, statistics, uh, if I pull it up here, I think it's 2.45. Um, let me just pull it up here. He's, he's got a great site, by the way. Just check it out. It's just trueflation.com. Uh, if I look at it, it's 2.41 is right now with the government reporting 4%. And, you know, he's shown a pretty good, pretty good trend line and it doesn't look like it's stopping. So, you know, it, it's an open question, right, that you need to consider is what's going to happen. So how do you prepare? Well, you know, you can prepare and say the Fed is going to lower rates, which means that the stock market is going to take off. You could prepare by saying the Fed is going to keep it the same, which would be you want to buy fixed income at these rates, um, you know, and but you have you can't I mean, you have to prepare for both scenarios. If you're not prepared, then you, you're going to get taken to the cleaners. And I think that's one of the challenges of this market that people are, are, are not understanding is and we can we can dub in, dovetail the next one, uh, Phil, too, about the stock market, where the stock market just recently broke out uh, of its range and everyone's claiming it's a new bull market. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. But um, but certainly the trend is is showing that. I live in the great state of Massachusetts. I may be the only one who calls it that, but I digress. The great state of Massachusetts has a commercial funded by the state that says you can't win the lottery if you don't play. For the moment, let's ignore the fact that there's a state-sponsored commercial suggesting that you go out and spend your hard-earned money gambling on lottery tickets with odds of over 100 million to one of winning. But it's true, you can't win if you don't play. I'm giving you the same opportunity here in the show. The only difference is I'm not asking you to buy a lottery ticket. I'm only asking five to 10 minutes of your time. But I will pay you at least 100 million Zim dollars for your time. We do have some foreign listeners. So if you don't like Zim dollars, we may have some other currencies as well. If you wanna earn over 100 million Zim dollars, go to www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money to get your free money today. So what do you think, Phil? I mean, what do you think of this market, you know, where it's going right now? So the first thing I'll say is whatever I say, I have no idea if that's really the case because we can't forecast. There's too many variables. But if we look at what's going on in the market, it's definitely trending in the right direction. I was looking at some data and I'm not a chart guy. Like I remember when I was an analyst and I get called and somebody's asking me about some chart and I'm like, I don't do technical analysis. That's not me. But the 50 day moving average for stocks in the S and P right now, like close to 60% of the stocks are above their 50 day moving average. If we look at the Russell 2000, which is smaller stocks, it's like 70%. So if we start to look at, those market measures, the market showing signs that this is a broader rally. It's not just led by these seven to 10 tech stocks that, it, that everybody talks about. 
it's becoming broader, but we have a lot of uncertainty there. Right? Like normally you don't have the market break out when you have the level of inflation that we have today. I mean, we have, I'm sorry, not just inflation, but also unemployment was the other thing I was in. Unemployment's still around 3%. That's really low for this kind of environment. So there's a lot of mixed signals that are happening right now as far as the market's concerned. It's certainly nicer to see it go up. And I mean, the year-to-date numbers are pretty strong, but that doesn't mean that it can't change because if we got to recession, that happens, it doesn't seem likely that the market's going to keep going up in a recession because usually it doesn't. It usually goes up before the recession ends because it, you see it coming out of that, but usually you have a decline going into recession. So we have a lot of conflicting factors here, which is why we talk about diversification and having exposure to different things because we don't know for sure what's going to happen. So we want to protect ourselves. And you know, these interest rates are great compared to, you know, we had no alternative before, right? You had zero interest rates. There's not much you can do with fixed income because you weren't getting anything. Now, at least you can get 5% on treasuries that are going out a couple of years. That's, that's much better than we had before. As a matter of fact, that 5% is actually ahead of inflation based upon the figures that we have right now. So that's not a bad scenario. So you want to make sure that you look at fixed income now in ways that you didn't look at it before. But where it's going to go, I can't say for sure. Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's important. You mentioned uh, Tina. There is no alternative, which was the the rule of the day for equities for many many years up until 2021, uh, 22 technically. Um, and you know, it's basically like, yeah, what are you going to do? Put your money in fixed income where you're guaranteed to lose money? Hey, I'm going to get you zero percent on this bond. Oh yeah, let me sign up for that. And uh, and then the rates go up and you lose like 30 percent of your money. Like that was just stupid. I mean, that's why a lot of these banks went under because they're just they were they were hunting for yield and they were like, oh, instead of one percent, I get one and a quarter. Let me go out thirty years to get that one and a quarter, and then they just lost their shirt and ended up going bankrupt. To me, that's just stupid risk management. I mean, I get the problem that they had, right? I don't think any of us were oblivious to the fact that there there was no alternative for them. But there comes a point in time where it's like, all right, what's the risk? Well, the upside is. Well, we're at zero. The upside is, well, actually there is no upside because you can't go below zero. The downside is you can go anywhere but zero, right? That's basically what it was for bonds. And I used to have these conversations with people all the time. Well, you need to have bonds for, for ballast, for stability. Why? Why would I want 0%? And on top of that, I've got a huge risk of losing money. Why would I want to do that? That's stupid. I'd rather just sit in cash. At least it's liquid. I'm not going to lose money in cash. You know, you've got flexibility with that. But now that bonds are are yielding 5% for treasuries, that's a pretty nice rate of return. Why wouldn't I consider that? And on top of that, when there was this Tina approach, the, the ir- there is no alternative, um, you know, all of that extra money. So the bond market is much, much bigger than the stock market. So you had all the, the extra money from the bond market flooding into the stock market. So, you know, that that also pushed the prices up of stocks because there's just an enormous amount of cash flowing in from the bond market. But now you've got 5%. It feels to me like there are a lot of people out there who are still not adding bonds to their portfolio. Like we haven't seen that rush because interest rates are still five, five, five and a quarter percent on U.S. Treasuries for, you know, zero to two years out. You're looking at agencies and the high fives you're looking at cds and the mid fives like that is those are not inconsequential returns you can get five percent with close to no risk why wouldn't you consider that um so i think that's the thing that you know as phil was saying we need to consider fixed income for a portfolio again and obviously rates could keep going up which i you know i mean the upside i thought was five and a half i think that's i think that's the max upside in my opinion um I'm not sure we'll go up. I mean, the, the Fed, I think, clearly said, um, I'm seeing if I can find it here in, in my notes, but I think what they said was that they're taking next month off, more or less, from raising rates, and then they're going to reinstitute, um, probably raise rates as it gets into uh, the fall. So they're going to take July off, and then I think in September, I think it was the next meeting, that they're going to uh, they're going to look at, at raising rates again. So. The consideration, I think, of what what is being predicted is two more raises for the end of the year, uh, which would bring it to five five and a half to five and three quarters. That's that's 
you know, that's in the range of what we're talking about. And the Fed also said that they're not predicting any recession for this year. So no recession for 2023. And, you know, I mean, you could, you could decide whether you believe the Fed or not, but uh, I, I don't, but I, I think you could, you could make that, uh, that determination yourself. So I was trying to find my notes here. Here it is. Uh, yeah, the Fed doesn't expect the U.S. to end a recession this year. They predict unemployment rate will be 4.1 at year end, down from the previous 4.5, um, which to me shows a trend of it's not going to be high, the unemployment, which means no recession in their mind. And they see uh, annual GDP rising 1% instead of 0.4. Um, so they're seeing a stronger economy. This is why it's so challenging. Stronger economy, it needs higher rates. That's that's how rates work. Stronger economy equals higher rates because you need to keep it cool. If we start lowering rates, the economy is going to go bananas. I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be crazy town. And and I think that's that's the challenge. So um, you know, I know we're kind of getting to the weeds this week, but I think it's it's a really important inflection point in the markets here. What we're seeing, the stock market's breaking out. Everyone's saying, well, we're just going to take a chance. Uh, and, you know, we're in an environment where everything's positive again, high rates, positive, low rates, positive. Everyone's just, you know, throwing money at it. So I don't know. It makes me think of it. You, you talked about behavioral, behavioral as aspects too. And I always think about the cycle of market emotions. And that's definitely something that happens, right? As the market goes up, we get more and more excited. We have the fear the FOMO comes in, the fear of missing out. We don't want to put we don't want to miss it. So we join in. And when do the most people join in? Right at the top. And then they watch it start to go down and then they jump out. And then by the time it bottoms, they're out. And then they don't go back until after it's already started to go up and, and they're late, right? Because you can't time it and you know, you your sentiment goes with the market. And honestly, we think about it when the mark when when difficult times, that's usually the best time to invest. Because you have to be a contrarian and you talked about it is Marx, by the way, with level two thinking. And you think about that level two thinking and you think about being a contrarian when the market's working against you. That's usually the best time because that's when you can find the best opportunities because things are depressed and then you get to benefit as they recover. Yeah, that's a, that's always been the, ch the challenge is at what point do you, you know, because we talked about earlier, six months ahead, right? And at what point are you looking six months ahead? So, you know, if most of the market thought that interest rates were just going to start going down, you know, mid-year, and then they push it out and push it out. And so if you were to look at that with the same lens of uh, higher interest rates equals lower market, lower interest rates equals higher market, then you would deduce, well, the market should be lower from here. Obviously, that's not true because there's so much that goes into market pricing that's well beyond that. Now, I, you know, let's, let's look at the market. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, share some things here and, and we can talk a little bit more. Um, but so here's some things to note. Okay. So the S and P 500 was pretty much within a range. Uh, it broke out somewhere in the neighborhood of, um, I don't know what that is, uh, with sometime this week, it broke out of that range. Uh, it was kind of topping and then broke out. The NASDAQ broke out a while ago. Um, and it's it's going higher and it's 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 kind of hitting a a, a I know Phil's not a chartist but I, I'm an amateur uh, chartist so uh, I think everybody's an amateur chartist I'm not sure they're professionals but um, uh, but basically they're hitting some resistance now but lower interest rates should equal a higher higher Nasdaq the problem is is if you look at the Nasdaq itself and you say wow it's up a lot from from the the bottom which we talked about last week which is always kind of a farcical number but that's what people use but then you look at the equal weight the performance is not quite the same and if you look at the s p 500 and then you look at the equal weight the performance is not necessarily the same i think this year up uh, as of a week and a half ago the s p 500 equal weight was zero performance even though the S&P 500 was up whatever it was, like 5% or 7%. So the performance of the equal weight versus the, the, the regular index was different. Now, I may be confusing the listeners here, so I'm just going to put this into context. What we basically mean is the S&P 500 is market cap weighted, which means the biggest companies get the biggest weighting. 
Apple gets the biggest weighting. Apple has done very well this year. It doesn't mean all of the sectors have done well, but Apple has done well. Microsoft's done well. You know, uh, Meta, Netflix, all the FANG stocks, those have, have done pretty well. And those have brought the performance of the whole index up. But if you weight everything equally, you'll find that the performance of the index is not great, which means that a handful of companies are pushing the performance of the market. The rest of the market is not keeping pace. So what does that mean to you? What that means to you is that if you're looking at a market and saying, hey, it's doing great, not necessarily. Certain stocks are doing great. And if those stocks start to falter, then the whole market could turn around if the other ones are not keeping up. So it's just something to keep in mind. And if you're looking at a market and you say, you know, hey, the equal weight is also taking off. All right. Th that, that means it's, there's a lot of strength into that trend. Right now, equal weights are basically still bouncing around within a range. So it's um, except for the NASDAQ, which has broken out. But the NASDAQ's mostly tech. And that's that's um, that's been doing a lot better than it was before, which it got decimated last year. Uh, it got really crushed. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at it from the low, you say, oh, yeah, it's done great. And like, yeah, after it got crushed, it's still it's still down like, you know, 20 percent from the peak. So it's not like it's uh, it's not like it's, you know, boom time. But but I think it's important to, like, look at these different metrics to to get some context of is this market a really a true bull market? Just being 20 percent off the lows doesn't make it a bull market. It might be from a, you know, a technical definition. But I don't invest by technical definitions, right? If you did, then you know you, you probably lose a lot of money. But if you look at it just rationally and say, all right, because uh, let's take an example, right? So Apple's Apple's done pretty well this year. All right, so it's done well. So if Apple, Microsoft, um, whatever the, the the Fang stocks take up twenty five percent of the index performance, and they've driven the market up this year. And the rest of the market has not done well, but but it's driving the performance. What happens if they don't do well? What happens if the, the stock price kind of comes down? Then that impacts the index in the same way. So you just, you know, if something's highly reliant upon a handful of things, you might as well just throw all your money in that in, in those handful of stocks, right? It's not the best way to invest um, for the market, but that's how the market invests. So I just kind of put it into context because we need to understand what is the strength behind the markets? Another example of this might be investing in gold, right? So if you invest in gold and you say, oh, gold's in a bull market, it's in a bull market for the U.S. dollar, right? So if you're a U.S.-based investor, you exchange dollars for gold. You buy gold with dollars. So you're, you're, you're getting rid of your dollars and you're getting gold in exchange. Well, as long as the U.S. dollar is declining and gold should be going up, reasonably speaking, the best time to buy gold is when gold is going up in every currency, dollars, yen, euros, won, whatever it is. Like you go across the board, if, if, if the gold price is going up in all of those currencies, that is a strong bull market in gold. Because what that means is it's not just the dollar that you're comparing it to. It's, it's a bull market compared to everything else. So you need to look at these, these other factors when you're looking at bull markets to determine if it actually is a bull market or if it's just... Uh, if it's just window dressing that people are using to, um, you know, to keep the market looking good. So, so talking about the market looking good, I'm going to go to a different area and way to look at things. Some people don't like this top, this area because it's accounting, right? Arcane stuff, but there's a lot that you can find out. If you look at how companies report earnings, there's two versions of earnings that they report. There's gap earnings, which is generally accepted accounting principles. And then there's after their, what they call their non-operating items or unusual items. Charlie Munger kind of refers to this as everything but the bad stuff, right? And it's not regulated by gap. When I was an analyst, there were certain things that I took the view that they shouldn't be excluded and I would include them. And I remember getting called by the, like some of the ratings agencies say, well, your earnings look different than everybody else's. I'm like, well, yeah, this company is excluding things related to the fact that it does business outside the US, you know, the currency related movements. Like, But they do business there. They do that every quarter. Why should I exclude that? There's a lot. So we've seen companies will do things too to boost their earnings. A couple companies that I can think of, large tech companies are in the FANG group, 
have extended the depreciation lives of some of their big servers. Maybe that's justified. Maybe it's not. But what does that do? It boosts their earnings. Because if I have an asset, we'll make the numbers simple, that I bought for $1,000 and I used to depreciate it over four years. That means I take $250 of expense every year. If I change that to five years, now I take five into a thousand and I take $200 of expense every year. So I just boosted my earnings by $50 a year. These things really can make a difference. I remember one of the best calls that I made as an analyst is a company called Chesapeake Energy. I don't know how many people remember that one. They ultimately went bankrupt. When I covered Chesapeake, when I first started as an analyst, I remember being on an interview with the, the Wall Street transcript and they were talking to me about oil stocks and they said, what CEOs do you like? And I said, oh, I like Aubrey McClendon and I gave all these reasons why. And then I used to listen to him on the conference calls. And one of my favorite books on investing is an old book by Phil Fisher called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. And in that book, Fisher has 10 things that you want to look for when you're evaluating a company. These are the fundamental aspects, not the, the mathematical aspects of the company, not the quantitative aspects of the company. And one of them was to avoid highly promotional management teams. And I would listen to Aubrey talk and he'd say, we have the lowest cost structure of anybody in the industry. We have a team that can forecast the weather better than anybody in the industry. We have people that can forecast the price of natural gas and oil better than anybody in the industry. Not possible they could be better than anybody in the industry and all those things. So as he kept talking, I kept hearing Fisher echo in the back of my head, highly promotional management teams, avoid them. So then I did a really fundamental thing as an analyst. I pulled out their 10K, which is the document the company filed. It's an annual document. It's their annual report. It's got all their statements, plus a lot of other disclosures and information about the company. And I took the accounting policy footnote and I compared the wording in it from one year to the next. And I noticed that depreciation lives changed. And I noticed that how they treated related party transactions changed. And then they had these things, they would sell properties and get these things called volumetric production payments. And they said that they weren't debt. They were debt to me because all they were doing was instead of paying back in cash, they were paying back in hydrocarbons, natural gas or oil. And there were, they would do these joint ventures where if you think back to 08 and 09, when oil prices started to fall, they had to keep investing because that's how they got paid. So they're just throwing good money after bad constantly. They had these long dated hedges that went out years and years and years. So I put a sell on that company. Then Carl Icahn bought it and the stock reacted. I took it off for a little bit and then things got worse to me and I put the sell back on. There was one of the reporters that I used to talk to. She told me that Chesapeake told her not to talk to me anymore because she should get a different, you know, a, a less biased opinion than mine. But wow. in the end, that company went bankrupt because of things like this. So you have to pay attention to all that stuff because if companies don't put up the numbers that they want, they're gonna tell you that this is a non-operating item or they're gonna tell you that we're gonna change the depreciation lives. They're gonna tell you something else that's gonna make their numbers look better than what they really are. And that's another thing that you have to be careful of, especially when you get into a market that starts to go up because companies now there's kind of more pressure on them to keep their numbers up because otherwise those, typical ratios that we look at, like the PE ratios, they, they start to get look bad if they don't have enough earnings to support it. So that's just something else you have to really watch out for when you're looking at these companies. So let me ask you this, Phil, and then we'll have to wrap it up here in a few minutes. Um, in your opinion, because to me, it seems like that's a widespread practice is manipulating earnings. Um, like what percentage of the of the market do you think is manipulating their earnings in a way that is going to obfuscate the reality? It's got to be a, a really high number. So you just have to decide for yourself what's okay, so to speak, and what's not, and just understand. And like, that's why I don't like to look at earnings. I want to look at cash flow because it's a lot harder to make things up and to obfuscate cash flow because that's kind of looking at the cash you're really taking in and the cash that you're not. I mean, I remember companies that I would talk to about cash flow, it was one company in particular, I remember their CFO told, told me that they had like gone to great steps to get control of things like their, how long it took them to get paid by their customers and 
and how long it took him to turn over their inventory and things like that because that affects their cash flow and he like almost lit up because i asked him that question he says i've done all this work you're the first person to ask me about it <laughs> so it's it's there i think most companies are doing it it's just some companies do it a lot more than others i mean you can a lot of people will rail about you know equity compensation right because it doesn't take money out of the company's hands but ultimately when a company issues a lot of stock options it does dilute the shareholders because it makes more shares outstanding and those people that are getting those stock options are getting them at a cheap price so i think if you look across the market if i had to guess it's at least 80 percent of the companies are doing this in some way shape or form yeah that's that's good to know i i um it's funny i remember back um before 2008 and GE was notorious for managing their earnings. And I mean, you could, I mean, you could uh, mark your clock to the earnings that they declared. I mean, they were always right. Microsoft was another one. They were always right. And there were a bunch of others. I just don't have them offhand. But uh, there were times where people were really good at managing those earnings because, you know, it was lumpy. There'd be big swings up and down and they would find a way to smooth it out. So it just uh -huh. made people feel better. And people love that. I mean, GE was great they they're always really on ball and then you know a company basically went under in 2008 uh even though they were kind of rescued and i don't know how they still stay in business but they do and um but you, you you've got you know i, I stopped following them but you, you've got companies like that that you know under jack welsh was managing earnings and and, um, and as you said it might be 80 percent of them i don't know like I, I i don't spend that much time in the weeds with um you know, with some of these companies, because it's just, is it worth it? I don't know. I mean, you're getting the real, you're getting the real deal or you, you, you have to kind of like sift through all the garbage and, you know, some companies, the numbers are good enough, right? You know, like there's, especially some tech companies, like you can just, you just know, like they're going to crank out earnings. They have great profit margins, even if, you know, like we, uh, some of my hedge fund buddies used to tell me they would they would uh, rip on Microsoft all the time because part of their model was to like, all right, we're going to take, you know, I forget the number, it was like two and a half billion and we're going to pretend like they lit it on fire again. And we're going to take that off, we're going to take two and a half billion, we're going to take it off of off of the numbers and we're going to go from there because whatever they do, they're going to waste two and a half billion on stupid <laughs> acquisitions or dumb things that they're going to write off. And it's just every year was something new. And then they got their new uh, uh, Nardello, which is, he's done a great job. So uh, kudos yes. to him. And he's really cleaned up the company and they've, they've been a lot more consistent and better, but, but it was just funny under Bomber, like he was such a poor CEO that it was just comical. They were like, yeah, it's still a good company. Even if you like two and a half billion dollars on fire every year. <laughs> like, oh God. Yeah. The best thing that happened to them was when Nadella replaced Bomber, because as you say, Bomber just, they made like the last, I think the last straw was when they bought Nokia, right? They were yeah. going to go into the handset business. Oh God. And you know, they had their whole operating system. I think I ran into one person that used that operating system, you know, that had a Microsoft operating system on their phone. And not that that was the only one that used it, but everybody was using something else. They weren't using that. And they yeah. just, you know, you know, I always think of it like there's also so many examples in history of companies diversification. Mm -hmm. That's what I call it. When you buy something that just doesn't fit with your business. And I mean, my wife has done work for, years for an insurance company that basically went and ran out of money right but it's still being supported by xerox why did xerox buy an insurance company no idea because insurance makes money xerox doesn't <laughs> <laughs> just saying it's not a recommendation by the way <laughs> oh man yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. Remember Skype? Yes. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I remember it, but did I use it? <laughs> no, I don't think anybody used it. Even when they forced people to use it, still no one used it. Um, all right, well, that's the show for this week. We're going to wrap up. So, Phil, where can people find more about you and any final thoughts if you got them? So, I guess final thoughts would be just as investors, be careful, make good decisions, and don't let your emotions get in the way and overrule what really makes sense. As far as where to find me, my firm is Apprise Wealth Management. That's apprisewealth.com. You can sign up for my weekly blog on my website. If you go to apprisewealth.com slash ebook, you can also download my free ebook. Great. Well, Phil, once again, thanks for joining us on the show. Always enjoy your sharing your wisdom with us. 
uh, as, as the listeners know, Phil's a, a new member of our rotation of our panelists. So we're, we're happy to have him. He's doing a great job. Uh, send us your love mail, your hate mail, uh, just send us mail. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely read it. And, um, we, we always read it because we want to make this show better. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us in Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at InnovativeWealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.